Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Dialogues on Nonviolence, Religion, and Peace. My name is Asher Kaufman, and I am the director of the John B. Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. This event is taking place on the traditional homelands of native peoples, particularly the Pokagan Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and continue to do so. As we gather here for this lecture and dialogue, it is important to acknowledge our own place in the story and practices of colonialism and our responsibilities, not only to make this gesture of land acknowledgement, but also to reflect on Notre Dame past, present, and future relationship with the Pokagan, the original stewards of this land. This is the 21st year in which the Kroc Institute hosts this event, which has been enabled by the generous gift of Anne-Marie Yoder and her family. Anne-Marie passed away on September 20th at the age of 94. We mourn her death with her family and we are grateful for her faithful support and commitment to the, sponsorship, to the sponsoring and the success of this uh, lecture series. Many members of the extended Yoda family are here with us today, and I thank them for their continued support uh, of this lecture series. The dialogues on nonviolence uh, and the religion are one of the signature public events of the Kroc uh, Institute. In the past, we have had a range of speakers who uh, led these uh, dialogues, from academics such as uh, Jean Sharp, Erika Chenoweth, and Miroslav uh, Wolf, to practitioners such as uh, Ricardo Isquivia, founding director of Justapas in Colombia, Jean Zaru, the Palestinian uh, peace activist and author, and Sarah Thompson Nahar former executive director of Christian Peacemaker Teams, the speaker at last year's uh, uh, dialogues. To this list of distinguished thinkers and activists, we add today Reverend Dr. Liz Theoaris. Liz is the co-chair uh, of uh, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, uh, together with uh, the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, that organized the largest and most expensive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in US uh, history. She is the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary. In the past two decades, she has been organizing amongst the poor in the United States, working with and advising grassroots organizations with significant victories, including the coalition of uh, Imokale uh, workers, the Vermont Workers uh, Center, Domestic Workers United, the National Union uh, of the Homeless, and the Kensington Welfare Rights uh, Union. Liz received her BA in Urban Studies from the University of Pennsylvania, her MDiv from Union Theological Seminary, and her PhD from Union in uh, New Testament and Christian Origins. She has published in the Time Magazine, The Guardian, Sojourners, uh, The Nation, The Christian Century, Century and other uh, venues. Liz is the author of Always With Us, What Jesus Really Said About uh, the Poor, and she is the co-author of Revive Us uh, Again, Vision and Action in Moral Organizing. Liz is an ordained minister in the, in the Presbyterian Church, and she teaches at Union Theological Seminary in New York uh, City. We invited Liz to deliver this year's Dialogues talk uh, as a sign of the Kroc Institute's own commitment to bring US domestic issues into the center of our academic uh, uh, programs, practice, and uh, policy. Many of our faculty work on different global issues from all over the world as much as on local matters. And we strongly believe that peace work starts at home. We also believe that the unjust socioeconomic disparities are at the core. In fact, they are the epicenter of some of the largest uh, challenges to peace and justice in this world. Fighting poverty, therefore, is a central goal for uh, peace builders. Notre Dame, as a well-endowed uh, Catholic university, needs to lead the way in the fight to end poverty, inequality, and injustice. 
In fact, the Kiel School of Global Affairs has made the fight to end poverty one of its uh, focal areas of uh, concern. And we at CROC, uh, as a leading unit within Kiel, are delighted to play a modest role uh, in this endeavor. And I thank Liz for taking the time to come and speak with us about her work and uh, activism. Before I give the podium to uh, Liz, a quick reminder of the structure of the dialogues. After Liz concludes her uh, talk, we would have a few moments for a short round of uh, questions. Then we are all invited to pick up uh, a lunch at a forum outside and go to room C103 to continue the dialogue with Liz in a more uh, informal uh, manner. So please uh, join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Liz Teraris to the podium. Good morning. So I actually want to start with a short video um, and then I will address you. We must be honest about the foundations of the political and economic systems we call America. I love America because of her potential, but I know that America will never even get close to being a more perfect nation until we are honest about the politics of rejection. I want to tell you about some of the leaders who are building the Poor People's Campaign. Callie Greer from Selma, Alabama, who had to bury her daughter, Venus, because she didn't have health care. I'm here today to share my daughter's Venus's story. Venus discovered a small lump in her breast and she wasn't insured. Venus had to be approved for every prescription and every piece of medical equipment that she needed. I'm standing here today in solidarity with the Poor People's Campaign because no one should have to bury their child in America because they don't have health care insurance. I'm 46 years old. I've lived in poverty here in West Virginia every day of my life. And I'm working. I am working poor with a bachelor's degree. I'm doing the best I can with what I have. I'm a second generation fast food worker and I've experienced the cycle of poverty firsthand. Growing up, I watched my mother endure long hours of backbreaking labor, doing everything she could to feed me and my sisters. My employer barely pays me enough to pay rent and utilities, let alone with the medical expenses with my mother. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. I have black lung, and it's just unfathomable what these poor coal miners That's right. have to go through in order to get what they have worked for and deserved. I'm a Vietnam veteran. My only chance of going to college was joining the Army. It was one thing to know that you didn't have water and you couldn't afford your water. It's a whole nother to find out that they shut off your entire community and none of you matter. But when I lost my housing, health care, and income all at the same time, I was terrified, panicked. Now, I'm also a Kansas farmer's wife. Kansas farmers are committing suicide at a far greater rate than the national average. Why? Because they're stressed out. They're stressed out. They're usually in debt up to their eyeballs because they can't pay for all the equipment that it takes to run a farm. And they're usually, they're in the most dangerous line of work there is, yet they, many can't afford to buy health insurance. We have no hospital. We are in a food desert. We have one grocery store for the whole county. Our neighbor, my husband's uncle, still drinks pond water self-treated with chlorine. He had to have a kidney removed at age 64. And the year before that, his wife died of some unknown cancer. Hi, my name is Pamela Rose. I'm from Niles County, Alabama. And I live in a mobile home with my two kids. And I got raw sewage. I don't have no, no money on pop. And I had to travel back and forth to Birmingham to 
take my daughter with the CPAP machine. Don't have a car and don't have no way to take her. This is the largest encampment in Aberdeen. There's about a thousand people in a town of 16,000 who are homeless. In my community, you all set up for the day because none of us could afford our water bill. In the past, my family was able to afford electricity in the winter. It was very hard on us. But the indigenous people in the surrounding communities that are being affected, we talk about health care. We talk about worrying about the environment. But yet when they're allowing open pit mines and um, letting it leak into the land, into the water, the high rate of cancer and the high bills of health is going to continue to raise because of corporations and greeds and politicians that don't want to listen. There's a new chemical company that's producing another carcinogen in our community. It's amazing. The people who are just started dying of cancer. And when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, I was amazed at the black women that would ring our doorbell and walk in the door and pull a wig off to show my wife that I have it too. This wall, this is sin of the highest form. I put my life on the line 17 years ago to uh, defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And right now, what we have, we have domestic enemies right here. When there are 38 million poor children, when 60% of African Americans are poor, when 65% of Latinx are poor, when 40% of Asians are poor, when there are 67 million poor white people, we must say, this is not right. Somebody's hurting our people, and it's gone on too long, and we won't be silent anymore. Our brothers and sisters are sleeping on the street. For a country this rich to have so many people poor, it's immoral and it's wrong. Our backs are against the wall, and we got no choice but to push. <laughs> We lift our voices for justice. We put our bodies on the line for mercy. And together we will proclaim liberty throughout the land for the enslaved, for the poor, and for us all. Yeah! All of that breaking news in Albany where a large group of protesters have moved into the street. Washington Avenue between City Hall and Lark Street closed down. Protesters with the Poor People's Campaign of Indiana. Two o'clock on the East Coast. Two o'clock in the middle, two o'clock on the west coast. A wave, and the historians tell us this never happened before. Our communities, Muslim communities, who have joined the Poor People's Campaign, you can count on us. Our democracy is in trouble. Our democracy is in trouble. And we come to demand. And we come to demand. Because it's crucial that we make ourselves heard. No one is listening. We write letters, we make calls. No one is listening. So we gotta make our find a way to make ourselves heard. We are the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and we are here. We are poor. We are clergy, and we're here to say to our nation's capital and to the highest court of this land that everybody has a right to live. Everybody has a right to learn. Everybody has a right to love. Everybody has a right to living wages. Everybody has a right to vote. Everybody has a right to thrive, to thrive in the society. We read Article 6 of the Kentucky State Constitution that said we have a right to free assembly. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. We demand the right to vote. There will be a movement that will break through the con 
and bring people together to save God and the soul of this democracy and this world. So thanks for having me here this morning. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, invited by the Kroc Institute and thanks especially to the Oda family for, for keeping this torch of peace and justice, nonviolence alive. I come to you this morning um, as an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church, as a biblical scholar, and as someone who has been organizing with the poor and homeless for more than 25 years. I started with the National Union of the Homeless and the National Welfare Rights Union. And today I am proud to serve as the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. I come to this work not just because it's right, but because it's necessary. I have been without health care. I have struggled with inadequate housing. I have worked low wage jobs throughout my life. As a mother of two children in the New York City public schools, whose schools are being privatized and defunded, surrounded by many in my community who cannot make ends meet, I believe that we can and must come together and make life better for our children. I was raised in a family that was dedicated to doing peace work and justice work, who followed the words of the Reverend Dr. King that peace is not just the absence of violence or tension, but the presence of justice. I was raised being impacted by one of my favorite quotes from the book of Jeremiah in the Bible. My people are broken, shattered, and yet they put on band-aids saying it's not so bad. You'll be just fine. Peace, peace, when there is no peace, but things are not just fine. And so I stand before you today, knowing full well that there are 140 million people in this country alone who are poor and low income, who I believe are crying out, peace, peace, when there is no peace. The video showed you some of the realities of people's stories and the larger statistics to back them up but I want to share a couple of with you a couple of those with you this morning that 43.5 percent of Americans are poor or one couple hundred dollar emergency away from poverty homelessness and destitution Cornell University says that 80% of us at some point in our lives will experience poverty. Today, when we woke up this morning, 39 million children were poor. 39 million children. 15 million families can't afford water. And 4 million families, when they turn their taps on, including here in South Bend, they had poison come out. 51% of kids in this country live in food insecure households. Perhaps you noticed on the video, a farmer and farmer's wife was talking about farmers living in food deserts. What kind of society allows profits from allowing that to happen? 
The U.S. spends 53 cents of every discretionary dollar on the military, but less than 15 cents on healthcare and education and anti-poverty programs and living wage jobs combined. But in such a time as this, I believe people are called to come together and build a movement of the people, by the people, and for the people. A movement that is involved and inspired by true peace and nonviolence. Because in looking throughout history, indeed, only movements led by those most impacted by injustice when they band together with leaders from faith communities and all walks of life, are able to transform society for the better. We get inspiration in our day today from the abolitionist movement. And I know of folks from around this area that were involved in that movement. A movement where slaves and ex-slaves came together, built an underground railroad, organized and moralized against slavery. And even when it looked like all hope was lost, still pressed through. Shortly after the Dred Scott decision, Frederick Douglass proclaimed a truth that I think we still hear today. I've learned from South Africans fighting apartheid this saying that a dying mule kicks the hardest. That when all hope seems to be lost, when oppression is running very strong, it's not because oppression has the last word. It's not that injustice is more powerful than justice. It's that when the possibility of transformation is at hand, the powers that be try to stop us from getting it. And so I read very regularly a part of Frederick Douglass's speech after the Dred Scott decision, because I think it speaks to the reality that we're living in today. He says, the whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her August claims have been born of earnest struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all exorbing, and for the time being, putting all other tumults to silence. It must do this or it does nothing. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who would profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle because power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. So if we are ever to get free from the oppressions and wrongs heaped upon us, we must pay for their removal. We must do this by labor, by suffering, by sacrifice, and if needs be, by our lives. Sometimes those words, I think, are in a slightly different frame than we're used to. But to go back in history and and see what those who have fought grave injustice have persevered through, have understood and have organized around should give us great inspiration. 
And so I read this quote from Douglas because I think it reminds us of that kind of courage, that perseverance, and that power that it was going to take to nonviolently and to fundamentally change the system that we're living in today. If we are serious about undercutting, addressing, and abolishing systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, militarism in the war economy, we need a moral analysis, a moral articulation, and moral action. If we are to challenge the false moral narrative that blames poor people for our problems, pits us against each other, and feeds us the lie of scarcity, we need a grassroots moral movement that is focused on saving the heart and soul of democracy of peace. So over the past two years, the Poor People's Campaign has been building coordinating committees of poor and dispossessed people, moral leaders, advocates, and activists in about 43 states, including here in Indiana. We have met tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people and chronicled people's demands for a better society. We've spent time in my home state of Wisconsin where the safety net has been shredded over the past decade. And families are going without heat and electricity even just today when it's so cold. We've been in Lowndes County, Alabama where you saw families like Pamela Rushes who have raw sewage in their yards even though the businesses in the same community have gotten sanitation services decades ago. We've been in Crossit, Arkansas, where a whole town has been poisoned by a paper, chemical, and plywood plant. And grandparents decide to meet their grandkids 80 miles from their town, from their home, just because they don't want to expose their grandkids to this kind of level of pollution. We've been in Pacoima, California, where one in four kids in Telfair Elementary School are homeless. And yet we have more abandoned houses, luxury houses in this country than homeless people. But people are criminalized and impoverished for moving into those houses. So in, 19, in 2018, we organized, as you saw, the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in 40 state capitals and in Washington, D.C., the largest wave in the 21st century. And then we returned to Washington, D.C. this past spring to organize the Poor People's Moral Action Congress. Drawing from the deep engagement with the stories and solutions that folks across this country have been putting forward, we have pulled together a moral agenda. We've said that we can have health care and living wage jobs and education and a peace economy over a war economy. And we can have it all. Many people have told us that we're being far too ambitious that our demands are politically impossible or that they just cost too much money. But this is patently untrue. The benefits of raising up people, organizing society around the needs of everyone far outweigh the costs. In fact, the cost of continuing immoral policies, of continuing to have a grave level of inequality, of continuing to prioritize military contractors over families is actually a cost that our nation and our world cannot afford. We believe, and I wanna to say to you today, that what is possible is a moral revolution of values that places the needs and demands of the poor and the planet at the heart of our budget, at the heart of our national discourse, 
at the core of our structures and policies. And that when we do this, this will create more jobs, it will build up our infrastructure, it will strengthen our economy, it will protect our resources for future generations. When you lift from the bottom, everybody rises. So I know this from economists, public policy makers, social scientists, but we also know this from our sacred texts and traditions. Deuteronomy 15 says that if you forgive debts, if you increase programs that lift up the poor, if you pay your workers a living wage, if you release those who have been captive to slavery and poverty, and if you lend out money knowing you may not get paid back, Deuteronomy 15 says your whole nation, your whole society will flourish. That's not the logic we hear on our TV, but we see it throughout our sacred texts and throughout history. God does not ordain poverty. The poor will only be with us as long as we are being disobedient to our constitution and to our sacred traditions. Poverty is people's creation. It is the creation of immoral budgets and unjust policies. And therefore, as a people, as a nation, as a world, as a global community, we can choose to end it. So I wanna share a couple of of the policies that we have found, some of the truths of this abundance, because I think often we get stopped in this lie of scarcity. Child poverty costs the United States $700 million a year. It costs $700 million a year to keep kids poor. And for every dollar, we spend on early childhood education, on child anti-poverty programs, we save $7 in the future. We invest it. Voter suppression, we have fewer voting rights today than we did 54 years ago, despite the fact that people died fighting for people to have those rights. But voter suppression, that's been enacted in 23 states through voter suppression laws is actually costing our country millions. In just one state alone, they've spent $385 million in administrative and court costs trying to justify illegal voter suppression. That same money could go into ensuring that all eligible voters have the right to vote. Failing to address climate change. Folks are telling us is going to cost about 16% of the United States gross domestic product. It basically wipes out more than $3 trillion from our, uh, from our economy. It isn't benefiting us. It's eliminating our future and charging us for it. In our endless wars and the 800 military bases that cost hundreds of billions of taxpayer dollars do not make our world any safer. Instead, we could cut $350 billion per year from the Pentagon budget. We still have a larger military budget than China, Russia, and Iran combined. And our world would be in less conflict. We could raise the federal minimum wage to a living wage and experience a ripple effect as that money is circulated back into the economy faster than any of the tax cuts that Congress has given the rich and corporations in recent years, or for bailing out banks too big to fail. 
we could gain $886 billion in estimated annual revenue from fair taxes on the wealthy corporations in Wall Street, and then invest in public infrastructure, creating jobs, especially jobs outside of the military. For every military job that we pay for is seven jobs for civilians. So investing in this war machine, in this violent system, it's costing us in our morality, in the violence that's happening across the world, and in cuts to programs and the lack of living wage jobs. In the richest country in the world, we have abundant resources. But the problem is, is that we have let our public policies funnel too much to too few. It's immoral for people to profit from moms having their kids taken away, which is what's exactly happening in Detroit, Michigan. Water multinationals can come in and pay $200 a year to bottle up as much of their water and sell it back to us. But if a mom has a $50 monthly bill that she can't pay, they take her kids away permanently. That is immoral. That is wrong. It doesn't have to be this way. So how are we going to achieve justice? How can we organize this moral revolution of values. I want to talk a little bit about the power of poor people organizing. Because in Detroit, where kids are being taken from their families because they can't afford their high water bills, grandmas like Marion Kramer are putting her body in front of trucks that are going to cut off people's water and engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience and then putting forth a water affordability program that has been able to be applied to Detroit and to communities across Indiana, Ohio, and beyond. That is the creativity, that is the ingenuity of poor people organizing for our lives and coming up with, with solutions of abundance. Danielle Morrow, a leader in Put People First Pennsylvania, who lost her mom because of inadequate health care, was able to band together and organize a vigil outside of the health care center that had denied her mom health care. Organize a vigil in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where there's been an upsurge of white supremacist violence, but with black Muslim moms and undocumented immigrants from Latin America and white families that are Christian in Johnstown and say, there's no hate here. We all deserve health care. I could tell you about low-wage workers with the Fight for 15 who have won an increase in wages for millions, or families in Kentucky who were able to enter their state house after being locked out of it, delivering toothbrushes to the elected officials and insisting that they stop attaching work requirements to Medicaid and to dental and vision plans. I can tell you about homeless white millennials in Washington State who are entering the prisons there. They have the highest incarceration rate for non-criminal offenses. And, and these white millennials from Aberdeen, Washington are making connections and learning from and, and engaging in nonviolent action with young people in Ferguson and St. Louis and all over the country and organizing young people in the jail in order to prevent white supremacists being able to recruit these young people into racist organizations. I could tell you about the families in Alabama who have come together from Lowndes County and Selma and Birmingham 
with unified demands and called for this Poor People's Campaign, said, let it start here, the birthplace of many movements in this country. And I think that to me, this all connects with a message that Dr. King gave in the last years of his life when he was talking about this world that we're trying to create. The night before he was killed in Memphis, Tennessee with striking sanitation workers involved in pulling together a multiracial coalition called the Poor People's Campaign, he said, it's all right to talk about long right, white robes over yonder in all of its symbolism. But ultimately people want some suits and dresses and shoes to wear down here. It's all right to talk about streets flowing with milk and honey, but God has commanded us to be concerned about the slums down here and his children who can't eat sweet three square meals a day. It's all right to talk about the new Jerusalem, but one day God's preacher must talk about the new New York, the new Atlanta, the new Montgomery, the new Philadelphia, the new Memphis, Tennessee. And so this is what we have to do. He said, this is what we have to do. This is what we have to do. We have to challenge an immoral set of policies across this country and across the world and build what he said was a nonviolent, intergenerational, multiracial freedom church of the poor. The Poor People's Campaign today, inspired by the one that Dr. King launched more than 50 years ago, believes that we're living in the midst of what some call a Kairos moment, a time of great change and transformation when the old ways of society are dying and new ones are being born. We believe that there's an emergency going on in this land and we need brigades of ambulance drivers who are willing to nonviolently disrupt the existing order. We are living in a time when there's a valley of dry bones. A valley of dry bones like the prophet Ezekiel talked about and we must cry out, can these bones live? We're living in a time when the sick and uninsured are saying to leaders of faith communities and to our politicians, if you choose, you can heal me. And waiting for an answer of yes, we do choose. So myself as a Christian minister, the God I follow cries out, I am the one who led you out of Egypt. That God reminds us that how we treat the poor, how we welcome the immigrant neighbor is how we honor and worship God. Jesus starts his public ministry by declaring, I have been anointed by God to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to all who suffer. He proclaims, I have come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus never proclaims, I didn't have enough food for everyone to eat. Nowhere does he say, I want Peter to have to rob Paul. It isn't in our scripture that Jesus says, get a job to the homeless of our society, nor that a little charity is as good as you all can do. Despite some of our politicians and religious leaders who mask their injustice saying, there's a biblical basis for building walls, there isn't. And nowhere in the Bible 
is it lifted up that we're supposed to sow division? Jesus travels around the land, setting up free healthcare clinics, never charging lepers a copay. And so in this time, we are to challenge this immoral narrative. We are to break through the collective trauma and the historical amnesia of a nation that is soul sick with itself. For as long as the dominant narrative in this nation remains that if millions of people just acted better or worked harder or complained less and prayed more, that they would be lifted up and out of their miserable conditions. As long as this lie survives, we won't know justice. This is a lie, it's immoral, and it's wrong. Dr. King had a saying that an accurate prescription for a disease rests on an accurate diagnosis of the problem. Therefore, in order to address the problems of racism and poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, in order to build a movement led by those most impacted, we have to know what the real problems, what the real realities of our society is. And so, we're traveling around the country, connecting up with the real heroes and heroines of this nation. Hearing about farmers living in food des deserts and undocumented families that have to go without seeing their families for 16 years. And from there, we're hearing it doesn't have to be this way. This is less than what we as a nation are called to be. How is it that we're gonna achieve justice? How is it that we're gonna raise those dead bones in the dry valley? We must organize. We must nonviolently disrupt we must educate, we must sing, we must protest. We must refuse to bow to violence and war and oppression. I hope that everyone here, if you're not already connected, will join the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We are getting ourselves ready for a massive Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington on June 20th, 2020. The day before the summer solstice where we will be bearing light, bringing light, birthing light into the world between the primaries and the conventions, making it impossible for our nation to go through one more election cycle where issues like living wages and poverty and voter suppression aren't at the center of our discourse and our action. We're compelled in times like these to stand up, to say that the bones have to live, to cry out, we as a nation choose to heal, to say, I lived at a time when people were dying because of copper mining, when folks didn't have running water, even though the world is made of two thirds water. And I linked arms with people like me and very unlike me and built a moral movement. I wanna close with one more quote from Dr. King. It's one that I think has everything to do with the moment that we're living in, even though it was from many years ago. He says, there comes a time when a moral man can't obey a law which his conscience tells him is unjust. And I tell you this morning, my friends, that history has moved on and great movements have come forth because there were 
those individuals in every age and every generation who are willing to say, I will be obedient to a higher law. Never forget that everything that Hitler did in Germany was legal. It was legal to do everything that Hitler did to the Jews. It was a law in Germany that Hitler issued himself that it was wrong and illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. But I tell you, if I had lived in Hitler's Germany with my attitude, I would have openly broken that law. I would have practiced nonviolent civil disobedience. And so it is important to see that there are times when a man-made law is out of harmony with the moral law of the universe. There are times when human law is out of harmony with eternal and divine laws. And when that happens, you have an obligation to break it. And I'm happy that in breaking it, I have some good company. I have Shadrach and Meshach and Abnego. I have Jesus and Socrates, and I have all of the early Christians and Muslims and Jews who refused to bow. To me, this is the message in our day. Can we refuse to bow to injustice, to nonviolently disrupt the current order? and challenge the immorality that low-wage workers trying to get $15 an hour are arrested, but that our politicians make $15 a minute and get off free. Thank you. We'll keep talking. Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. I am Father Hagos from Ethiopia. Uh, I'm so impressed by the uh, campaign, nonviolence campaign, that people are able to uh, voice out, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the cause of poverty and the, the real poverty where they are living in. But I uh, would like to uh, maybe know if there is any response to that campaign, especially in Washington, the, the, the campaign that we have seen on the video? So this is um, a great question. Um, there's been numerous responses. Uh, the first response that we saw was that days after we concluded these 40 days of moral direct action, uh, the person in the White House came out saying that there was no poverty in the United States. The US ambassador to the United Nations started to challenge the definition of poverty and said that anyone that is, it's, it's wrong uh, to be investigating poverty in the US um, when there are bigger problems around the world. So to me, that was a very strong reaction. It was that you only have to deny the truth if it's starting to get out there. So it was the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience. We were in every major news outlet. Um, we trended nationally on Twitter and have continued to do so as, as folks take action together. And, and what we've seen already is a shift in the dialogue and the narrative around who is poor, what is poverty, and what our society is supposed to do around this. We have a lot of work to do. We were invited to present this moral, poor people's moral budget to the House Budget Committee. And I was telling some folks this morning, we walked in, we presented our budget to the folks that make the US budget. And the first response to our testimonies and to our solutions came from a representative who 
first said, you know, there's a lot of poverty in this district. Uh, there's a lot of hardship going on for people. And then said, but he's a good Christian and nowhere in the Bible has he read where Jesus tells Caesar to care for the poor. It was a really brilliant moment, right? And so the, the first question that we kind of challenged him with was, really, you're calling yourself Caesar. We might know that that's the case of many of our politicians, that they see themselves as Caesar, but how would you say you're Caesar when you also call yourself a Christian? But also, then we kind of continued to challenge and said, well, what do you mean there's nowhere in the Bible where instructions to nations go out about how you organize society around the needs of the poor? It's, it's really the whole story of the Bible, starting in Exodus <laughs> and even in Revelation, right? You know, the whole arc um, is one anti-poverty program after another. It's more than that, but it is that. And so, so we know that we have a lot of work to do. You know, some of the different presidential candidates have been coming forward and starting to use some of our statistics, starting to tell some of our stories, starting to even visit some of the communities where we're organizing in. Um, and, and we're saying, you know, it's, it's, it's not enough. I mean, we don't, we're a, we're a very political movement, but we're not partisan. Um, but we do believe that we have to hold out and organize people around an agenda. And that's what poor folk are doing. Um, and that's when you kind of get the change that you're going to get. Um, you know, Dr. King said that power for poor people will mean that you have the aggressiveness, assertiveness, ability, and togetherness to make the power structures of our nation say yes when they may be desirous of saying no. So it seems that like still the power structures are desirous of saying no, but can we build up the power that they will say yes? And, and what we've seen so far in some of the the smaller victories that folks are waging in their states um, and some of the larger questions and narrative shift that we're doing is that there has been that response, but we also will be back in DC on June 20th, 2020. And I hope everyone will join us for that. So this, this should be enough of a question to keep us for a while uh, first. <laughs> so thank you a lot both for the presentation and for you know a full generation of work organizing uh, on behalf of all of us right um, there are three concepts that are really central to the poor people campaign work which people put out as though they have universal understanding and I'm wondering whether you'd be willing to wade into any one or more of the three to help us know how you're situating them. And so we talk about moral justice and dignity. None of the three of those are fully, you know, clarified anywhere. So I'm wondering how, if at all, you all are talking about the three of those. Yeah. So again, we could, we could spend a long time, many books and many discussions on it. Um, so I might touch on two of them. In terms of the question of moral, um, in generations throughout history, when injustice is on the rise, there's always a battle over what is moral and immoral. There's always a battle of theology and of sacred texts and Bible um, where those who want to keep things the way that they are define morality in very individualistic um, terms when our sacred texts, our constitution, and various other documents and, and movements that have defined what values we should hold up, divine morality in a, in a much broader way. So we, we suggest that the real moral issues of our day are, does everybody have health care? Are you paying people a living wage? Are kids able to live to their fullest potential? Um, and we back that up by saying that this is what our constitution, even is in its imperfection, talks about what the moral values of our nation are. And it's also what sacred texts across um, traditions um, speak about. And so 
So we are, you know, battling around this question of morality um, and saying that, that simply defining moral issues are prayer in schools, gun rights, private property rights, has very little to do with the moral issues that are discussed in the Bible or in other documents across the, uh, across the country and world. Um, so, so that's really important, right? So we're called the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And, and that's because we, we think that this nation is in a moral crisis. Um, uh, it's a structural crisis. It's a, a crisis of, of, you know, holding up profit in corporation and greed over, over humanity. Um, and, and then part of how we get at that is, is talking about this question of justice. So the Poor People's Campaign has identified five issues that we consider interlocking injustices that we have to address all of to be able to address any of. Um, and so some of that takes inspiration from Dr. King who talked about these tripartite evils of militarism, racism, and poverty. Um, we, as we were traveling around the country and, and talking to poor folk about, you know, what the issues of the day are, definitely saw those three, but then needed to add more. We, we didn't go to any poor communities and not see this crisis of the, of the environment and earth um, just rearing its head. That those that are most poor and most marginalized are bearing the brunt of the climate crisis, um, of environmental racism, of uh, you know the the polluting of our water systems, um, and so you 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 know you you can't actually talk about poverty or racism or or militarism. Um, the fact that actually they've passed uh, laws that make it um, a federal felony to be protesting, trying to protect against pipelines coming in. Um, the militarization of basically communities to, to stop some of the protests that are trying to fight for water and earth and, and land, land and air rights. Um, but then we also had to look at those four injustices of racism, of poverty, of militarism, and of ecological devastation, and, and look at what has kind of been a glue that's held those injustices together and put a veil on our politicians um, for inaction around it. Um, in the words of Dr. Barber, who is the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, you know, these, uh, these preachers, these white nationalist preachers and, and false narrative promoters who pray, P-R-A-Y, over politicians that pray, P-R-E-Y, on the poor and the marginalized. And so, so this kind of false moral narrative of, of white Christian nationalism, of religious nationalism, of, of, and a narrative that again, you know, pits us against each other, that, that, uh, that blames people and not structures for these issues and that feeds us this lie of scarcity. And so, so we, we say that it's impossible for, if you're serious about trying to upend racism, that you're gonna to have to have an intersectional approach and you're gonna to have to take on poverty and war and environment and this narrative. If you're serious about being a peace person, then you can only be serious if you're talking about uh, the security of, of, uh, uh, of prosperity for everyone um, and, and, and kind of so on. And so, you know, basically what Dr. King says is that the Achilles heel of a system of racism poverty and militarism is organizing those who have little or nothing to lose. Um, and so that's really what the Poor People's Campaign is doing. And I can talk about dignity because it's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, please join me. Oh.